Oh, well, thanks so much for the wonderful introduction, Leo. And I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I do feel like I'm, I've had a lifelong obsession with maps, like all of you here. And uh, yeah, I'm just really delighted to get this talk over with and I can enjoy all of your presentations, the rest of the conference. Um, so tonight I'm gonna share some of my misadventures exploring the edges of things from, from nations to the limits of endurance to my own sanity at times. Um, so in other words, I'm gonna talk about borders and the different ways they, they make and break our world um, from mountain ranges and deserts to, to people's minds. So my obsession with borders was born all at once in three different countries, depending on who you ask. Um, I was in my early 20s and I was biking with a friend across uh, the parched soda plains of a place called the Axai Chin. And there are probably people in here that have drawn maps of this. Um, but for weeks we pedaled across this high altitude wilderness. You know, it's a land spread wide as wings, folded here and there into mountains. And uh, the only real color are these lakes, these turquoise lakes that just look like puddles of sky. Um, you know, there's no greenery, there's no grass, there's no trees. Um, and nothing, no one really lives here. Nothing moved except herds of Tibetan antelope in the distance on some days, um, or dust tornadoes that would spin across the road ahead of us. And so on a daily basis, the wild fact of being here um, basically knocked me off my bike, or maybe that was the terrible road. Um, and I kept asking myself, you know, where in this spinning world was I? And if I asked a, a Chinese person, or at least someone from the Chinese government, um, they would say I was in China. If I asked an Indian, they would say I was in India. And if I asked a Tibetan, they would say I was in Tibet. Now, if you ask me, I was in paradise, no further names necessary, but it was a troubled paradise then and still. So this desert of, of salt and wind, pretty much uninhabited and um, dismissed by most, by most people as a wasteland, the Aksai Chin is, is weirdly one of the most contested territories in Asia. So it's Tibetan by cultural heritage, it's Indian by historic treaty claim, and it's Chinese right now by virtue of possession. Um, and it all began in the late 50s when China secretly built a road across this, this region, this inhospitable region, and that was the very road we were on. And India, they only noticed that this road existed about a, a decade later, and the discovery detonated a war over this hypoxic borderland. And even today, most of the Himalayan frontier in this, this part of it anyway, between India and China um, is still disputed territory. So uh, big chunks of the border are just kind of a, a blur as if someone had smudged the ink on the map before the labels and lines had a chance to dry. So you might be wondering how on earth did Mel and I manage to enter this contested territory? And the short answer is that we broke all the rules. Um, foreigners require permits and guides to travel legally in, in what China now calls the Tibetan Autonomous Region. And Mel and I didn't have either of these things, but we were inspired. Um, some of the earliest European explorers of Tibet uh, didn't have permission either. They just snuck in, like Heinrich Harrer. Uh, he was an Austrian mountaineer who was imprisoned in India during World War II, and he escaped over the mountains and uh, made his way into Tibet and famously lived there for seven years and befriended the Dalai Lama. But I was even more emboldened by an earlier explorer named Alexander David Neal. So in 1924, at the age of 55, this French woman snuck across the Tibetan plateau, disguised as a Buddhist pilgrim, and uh, eventually made it to the forbidden city of Lhasa. Now her, her pilgrim's attire wasn't sacrilege, she was a pretty devout Buddhist, but it, her journey to Lhasa was in defiance of um, the Tibetan authorities, who at the time forbid all foreigners from coming to their country. So today, by contrast, it's a Chinese government that forbids foreigners from, from traveling freely through the Tibetan Autonomous Region. So Mel and I didn't want to buy permits that only reinforce this power asymmetry. And we also didn't want to be led around on a leash. You know, we just graduated from university and life felt unlimited. It was, you know, we'd never met a barrier we couldn't somehow muscle past. So we woke up at 3 a.m. and we duct taped the reflectors on our bicycle wheels and, and pedals, and we crawled beneath the lowered guardrail of a checkpoint on the edge of the Tibetan plateau and dragged our bikes under after us, and then we pedaled as fast as we could into forbidden territory. Now, this is a new extreme for both of us, um, but it wasn't totally out of character. Uh, we'd been friends since the age of 10, and um, what sort of defined our friendship was that we consistently propelled each other places neither of us would have dared go alone like elementary school science fairs. <laughs> As you can tell, we were the coolest kids in school. 
Um, the two of us grew up in small town Ontario, and it seemed to me that we grew up in a world of diminished possibilities. Um, I wanted to be an explorer in the historic sense of the term, one of those Shackleton or, or Nansen types with an appetite for cold gruel and a knack for endless slogging. And, um, but when I looked around me in Ontario, you know, the tallest mountain I could see was a haystack, and the widest horizon was a field of corn, and it was pretty clear I'd been born centuries too late for the sort of life I wanted to live. And the more quaint and cultivated my surroundings, the more I craved the total opposite, of course. And in small town Ontario, I mostly found wildness in books. So one of my favorites, I was a voracious reader as a kid, and one of my favorites was this, this exact book, and my mom gave it to me. It had been hers when she was a child, so her, her maiden name was inscribed on the inside cover, and I felt like it was endorsing the adventures um, described within. And the adventures described within were about Marco Polo and his travels on the Silk Road, the ancient trade route that for a thousand years ferried people, goods, and ideas from Europe to Asia and, and back again. Um, you know, the pages showed Polo roaming far-flung lands by a camel caravan, and he basically looked intrepid and rugged and every bit the explorer, and I wanted to be just like him. So meanwhile, I plotted his travels on a map, tracing the Silk Road, which is actually many, many roads, um, past its fabled trading hubs. But what actually interested me most about those maps were the um, hinterlands between the trading hubs, so places like the Tibetan Plateau. Now, I found out later that Marco Polo despised the Tibetan Plateau. He claimed that Tibetans were the greatest bandits on earth, and he complained about how far you had to travel before being able to resupply, and you know, complained about wild beasts, which are so numerous and so dangerous. So naturally, these warnings only made Tibet all the more appealing. And then another favorite childhood read was Alexander David Neal's book, My Journey to Lhasa. And in many ways, it was, it was the closest thing I'd found to a true portrait of the explorer as a young woman. And I didn't mind that she was you know, 55 when she trespassed into Tibet, because it was more her motivation that, that inspired me. You know, she wasn't trying to find herself through travel, um, which is often the case with, when you read travel books by women, it's always about an emotional journey of finding oneself. And there's, that's all well and good, but um, what I found refreshing about David Neal was that she wasn't trying to find herself, she knew herself just fine. And what she was looking for, if anything, was an outer world as wild as she felt within. And so I, I really related to that. And David Neal found it in Tibet. She wrote, I have a homesickness for a country that isn't mine. The steppes, the solitude, the eternal snows and big skies up there haunt me. So after reading her book, I was similarly homesick for Tibet. Um, but as a kid, I, I couldn't afford to travel there. And after studying all the maps I could find of the place, I was quite alarmed to learn that the Tibetan Plateau already had highways sneaking across it. Now, I would learn later that highway is a bit of a euphemism for <laughs> what I'd find. Um, but still, I worried that by the time I saved up enough money to actually see Tibet for myself, it would be as, as fenced and paved over as southwestern Ontario, where I lived. <laughs> so I began to panic that I was, I was wilder than the world in all directions, and there seemed few outlets left anywhere for the kind of restlessness that ached inside me, you know, this longing for a world without maps so I could make them. Um, my only hope, I came to realize as a teenager, was to actually completely leave this world behind. Um, so I decided to become a scientist with the goal of one day emigrating here. <laughs> I think most teenagers long for another world, but I was the only one in my small town that specifically pined for Mars. Uh, my buddy Mel was not with me on this obsession. And our neighboring planet, it appealed to me as a world of exploratory first waiting to happen. Um, the last place in the solar system, really, where a person could feasibly walk around and leave the first footprints. So I studied hard at school in hopes of launching myself there someday. And I really didn't doubt this extraterrestrial mission in life until I had the chance in my second year of university to spend two weeks at what's called the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah, specifically Hanksville, Utah. Now, Hanksville is mostly famous as the desert hideout of Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch. Um, they would shake off law enforcers in its maze of red canyons. And these days, the canyons host crews of a less wild bunch, um, wannabe Martians, who wear fake spacesuits while going through all the motions of living on another world. So picture like cattle tracks and clumps of sagebrush and a white space capsule gleaming in front of this wilderness. So for a while it was fun, it was like a grown-up game of make-believe, but as I, I trudged around Utah wearing this plastic visor helmet and a canvas onesie spacesuit, 
I was disconcerted by the fact that whenever I looked at a mountain, I just saw this veneer of, of plexiglass. And when I reached out to touch canyon walls, the color of embers, I, would, I wouldn't feel sandstone, I would feel my glove. And I realized that the very technologies that would keep me alive on Mars made me feel at a real remove from the place. So my interactions with it came to see, seem pretty like neutered and sterile and more than slightly absurd especially when we ran out of food on the red planet and we had to go to the local grocery store wearing spacesuits <laughs> to resupply our rations. <laughs> so here we are, trudging around. So after two weeks of following orders and speaking in acronyms and inhaling recycled air and reporting my every move to a mock mission control, I realized I'd had my fill of, of living on Mars. And I, I didn't admit, admit it to the rest of the crew at the time, but I was pretty homesick for my native planet. So on the final night of the simulation, um, I actually slipped out of the airlock without putting on my, my spacesuit first. And if I'd done that on Mars, I would have died in like three ways at once. Um, but here I just breathed in desert air spiked with sage beneath a, a night sky tacked up with stars. And all this got me wondering, you know, what am I lo really looking for in exploration? Um, and I began thinking back to my childhood heroes, people like Marco Polo and Alexander David Neal. And I realized, you know, they're both considered explorers, but all they really did was travel to lands that were new to them and old to others, and then write about what they saw. And so I thought, you know, could exploration be so simple? And, and I, think, I think it is, you know, well, it might sometimes, and certainly historically, has resulted in new territory conquered or a heightened mastery over the material world. I think exploration's real value lies in how it expands our consciousness, our sense of connection to each other and the wider universe of, of which we're a part. So with this idea of exploration in mind, I decided to go and, and see the Silk Road for myself, this childhood dream. Um, traveling by camel caravan seemed the, you know, the perfect, the, the, the most accurate way to do it if I wanted to be like Marco Polo. But a bicycle was a pretty good substitute, especially since the roads would be as bumpy as a camel's back. And uh, bicycles also had the bonus of being unlikely to spit at me in, in anger. Um, and I only had a few months of summer vacation. This is, I had just finished up university. So I figured I'd just start with the Chinese stretch of the Silk Road, which offered the densest concentration of places that Polo most feared and, and dreaded, like the Tibetan Plateau. So I, I outlined this plan to my parents over the phone. And they were dubious. You know, I didn't even own a bicycle at the time I proposed it. Um, I didn't know how to fix a flat tire. Um, and finally they sighed and said, please go with a friend. And so I asked my childhood buddy Mel if she wanted to join me, and she agreed faster than you can say Marco Polo, Mel's always game. Um, that we, two of us here had just finished running the New York City Marathon together, so biking the Silk Road seemed the next logical step. <laughs> and that's how we found ourselves sneaking into Tibet while the guards snored and the stars looked the other way. Now, as it turned out, it didn't matter at all that we'd broken the rules to be here. The authorities didn't care. Um, the only reason soldiers ever stopped us was to take photos of us with their cell phones or to test ride our bicycles like this dude. <laughs> so this was a, a relief, especially when Chinese military convoys passed us on the road, which were the closest things to dangerous wild beasts we saw in Tibet. But this easy access was also a bit of a letdown. You know, I'd been such a goody two-shoes my whole life. There I was floating the law for the first time and no one even noticed. Um, but if a hunger for risk and adventure had propelled me into Tibet, I left the place haunted by the human rage for order. Because the checkpoints we snuck, po we snuck through in the middle of the night weren't actually designed to keep foreigners out so much as to keep Tibetans in. So in the 1950s, the People's Republic of China invaded this once independent nation and basically forced the leader, the Dalai Lama, to sign over sovereignty. And he eventually had to flee for his life into India. Many hundreds of thousands of Tibetans followed him into exile. But those who stayed behind essentially became prisoners in their own country. You know, they were denied religious freedoms, denied meaningful passports. And today, even just possessing a photo of the Dalai Lama is enough to get a Tibetan arrested. Now, of course, taking sides in any historical conflict requires some amnesia. Uh, Tibet's own history is blighted by acts of, of greed and colonialism. And in the seventh and eighth centuries, the Tibetan Empire actually stretched into parts of what are now, um, or were Chinese cities in its quest for expansion. So this isn't to downplay what the Chinese government is doing in Tibet, but rather to warn against black and white thinking. 
And I was really struck by something I read. The Dalai Lama himself, who has every right to be furious about the situation, um, he says he doesn't see Tibetans as categorically good or, and Chinese people as categorically bad. Instead, he sees potentially good Tibetans and potentially good Chinese, um, so whoever he meets. So I tried to be that open-minded as I biked, but even as everything we saw in Tibet basically built a case for bias, like uh, destroyed monasteries. So admittedly, I'd spend more time using about history and borders when I, I got back home and I could actually breathe. On the plateau, the flattest plane was above 15,000 feet, um, and I was more preoccupied with sucking oxygen into my lungs. And the road, uh, as you can see, was hardly a road at all. Um, it, some days it was barely there, be it like a faint scar and rubble. Other days it would be a stream. And the wear and tear on our bikes and bodies was pretty intense. Here's Mel posing with her bicycle tire, who's whose tread has just been worn to nothing on these gritty roads. But as you can see, her hair held up beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> so our bikes were just, you know, we were carrying so much stuff, uh, tents, sleeping bags, bike tools, first aid kits, spare parts, maps, water, food. Um, and I think we had at least four books, essential, essential <laughs> materials for travel. Um, and there was, there was never enough to eat. We basically wasted to bone on a diet of, we had instant oatmeal for breakfast and instant noodles for dinner, and we'd mix both with, with peanut butter. That was our main protein source. But even if there had been grocery stores or restaurants in all across uh, Western Tibet, which there, there weren't, Mel and I actually had no cash left to buy fresh rations because we'd stashed my last $100 uh, US bill, which is our emergency money, in the hollow metal tubing of my handlebar. We thought this was a really good hidden place to put the money. But after months on the road, the money was stuck fast inside. We tried to use a bike spoke to, to get it out, but it was welded to the aluminum. So I was effectively riding around this piggy bank. But none of the hardships mattered because the Tibetan plateau was so otherworldly, it was like we truly launched to another planet. Um, biking there was kind of how I'd imagined it would feel to be on Mars, um, only way better, because I could breathe, I could laugh out loud, I could feel the wind on my face. And spacesuits, as I'd learned in Utah, really fence you off from all that. Now, I left Tibet craving the sort of intimacy with immensity that a bike trip offers you on a daily basis. Um, and I also left with a serious grudge against borders, the ways they exist for some people more than for others, um, the ways they fragment landscapes and lives. And so I had the chance to, immediately after that bike trip, I went off to Oxford. I, I won a scholarship there, and I could basically study whatever I wanted, which was an incredible gift. And I chose to enroll in this um, master's program on the history of science, mostly because I wanted to study the history of borders and science and exploration in the greater Himalaya to try and understand where some of these random lines on a map came from. And th this meant I got to do for homework what I normally did for fun, which was uh, read expedition diaries by early explorers. Like the redoubtable Fanny Bullock Workman. This gal was a, a wealthy amateur naturalist from America. And in the early 1900s, she famously climbed up to 21,000 feet and um, unfurled this poster that, that, was, that declared, didn't ask, uh, votes for women. So she was a hardcore feminist uh, before we, we had the word feminist. Um, and she'd go on to win fame for mapping what was then, in the early 1900s, a true terra incognita, namely the Siachen, Siachen Glacier. So this, this massive spill of ice is just across the Karakoram Mountains from the Aksai Chin, where we had been biking. And it was actually one of the last gaps on the map until Fanny um, strolled in and, and studied it and realized it was 40 miles long, which made it, at the time, the world's longest known glacier outside the polar regions. So half a century later, Siachen actually lost that uh, distinction when a glacier in Tajikistan proved longer. But it gained another, if more dubious, distinction of becoming the world's highest altitude battlefield. So when the line of control was drawn through contested Kashmir in 1972, the boundary was terminated at this fairly random survey point, NJ9842. And from there, they just extrapolated it, or they said, you know, it, it extends from there, um, thence north to the glaciers. And Saichin was basically left out. It was deemed useless, this, this wasteland of ice. So this, this textual ambiguity 
first led to um, territorial confusion with both India and Pakistan claiming Saichin on their maps, and eventually it led to war. So basically, India invaded the glacier in 1984 to prevent Pakistan's paper-based borders from becoming a reality. And Pakistan responded by sending its own troops up on Saichin, and it was kind of this escalating altitude race to the staggering heights of human absurdity. So this was um, in the early 1980s, and ever since, soldiers from both armies have lived at heights that mountaineers don't really dare linger at. And uh, a ceasefire has been in place since 2003, but avalanches and altitude sickness continue to claim lives on Saijin. And nature is another casualty of the conflict. Uh, Saijin's been described as the world's highest and biggest garbage dump, because so much material is brought up, but it's too expensive to bring it back down. Um, so Saijin intrigued me. You know, the, the huge costs of this bitterly cold war, um, you would think would give each country ample incentive to, to demilitarize the glacier, but what it lacks in, in, in strategic worth, it makes up for in the kind of symbolic value, and neither country wants to lose face by, by losing Siachen. So like the Aksai Chin, Siachen was another wilderness once dismissed as a wasteland and now tangled in this, this web of borders and, and competing claims. So for my thesis at, at Oxford, I, I studied that history and I tried to look at how science and exploration had kind of precipitated the conflict with, with these maps and also how science and exploration might, might offer a possible solution to it in the form of conservation across borders, you know, cooperative projects in the name of science, which can be a kind of neutral ground for people to to work on in an idealistic world anyway. So I'd, I'd spent an awful lot of time in the library at Oxford, and when I finished my degree there, um, I was pretty keen to do some exploring myself. And so I, I pitched the idea to Mel that we should finish the Silk Road, but this time we didn't want to venture to be the only point of the journey. Um, instead, we wanted to kind of swerve into contested borderlands all along the historic Silk Road and, and try and study how wildness of all kinds from you know the human mind to to in an ecological sense survives between borders and despite borders and and um, beyond them so i'll give you two quick examples of what i mean before i i, I take you back to tibet so first we'll go to the karst plateau in eastern turkey so most of turkey enjoys a pretty temperate climate but when we set off um it was february and Kar is, is the Turkish word for snow, and it seemed to us like the Kars Plateau was just spelling it out in the plural. There was so much snow, it was freezing cold. Mel might be looking like she's having a grand time here, you know, cartwheeling down the road and enjoy, but she's actually trying to centrifugally force blood to her extremities. <laughs> and while we were in Kars, we visited this place called Ani, and it's known as the city of a thousand and one churches. And this was once the ancient capital of Armenia and a major, major stopping point on the Silk Road, a major trading hub, and it's now mostly ruins. And the gaunt remains of its cathedrals and mosques might suggest a kind of openness, but behind them is the border between Turkey and Armenia, which has been hermetically sealed due to conflict for more than two decades. And the border is demarcated by a river, the Akurian, which flows next to Ani through um, this canyon here, Arpache. And both edges are, are strung with barbed wire. It's a military buffer zone. No humans have been allowed inside for um, decades. But a, a local scientist, this, this Turkish uh, bird biologist, requested permission after a while to trek inside it because he was curious about what was living in there, if anything. And um, he eventually got permission from the Turkish Armed Forces to do this, since so we did this kind of transect up the canyon. And in the process, he discovered a half dozen nests of Egyptian vultures. And this is a, a species of raptor threatened with extinction around the world. Um, and they'd basically found a, a rare swath of undisturbed land in Arpache, um, you know, ideal breeding grounds between the barbed wires. And I was torn between wanting to applaud this oasis of wildness and uh, despairing the fact that it took strife to create it. You know, ecosystems are so often the casualties of our borders and, and human communities certainly suffer from these same divides. But places like Arpache wear borders almost like a bulletproof vest with wildlife finding asylum between the walls our conflicts create. And a little further down the Silk Road, we biked into the Pamir Mountains where another river defined another border, this time between uh, Tajikistan and Afghanistan. So we followed this fluid border to its source high in the Pamir Plateau 
And eventually the road just disappeared in the grass and the river disappeared into a lake and all signs of a frontier vanished with it. And on the mountains all around us were thousands of Marco Polo sheep. This is a, a wild species named after the Silk Road Explorer. And to us, it looked like they were grazing on rock. Um, we couldn't understand really what they were eating. And uh, they could migrate freely between nations, you know, totally oblivious to the lines on our maps. There were no fences up there, nor um, sign of the border whatsoever. And we were tempted to follow the herd, but fears of landmines kept us within limits we couldn't even see. Now, the next day, after biking past that lake, uh, Mel and I were invited to stay at a trophy hunting camp. Um, and this is an invitation we accepted with some trepidation. You know, I'm, we're not big fans of hunting by any stretch, especially when it's not for the sake of um, sustenance, but a, a you know, prize to put on your wall. But while we were there, we learned that foreigners will pay up to 25,000 US dollars to obtain a pair of these famously curly horns of the Marco Polo sheep. And I came to realize that while a gunshot involves a sort of singular act of violence against an innocent creature, and is therefore pretty easy to condemn. What's much harder perce to perceive, never mind stop, is the sort of slow, complicated violence of life in a country with very limited options. So Tajikistan is the poorest of all the former states of the Soviet Union, and it's a country that can't afford to do wilderness conservation the way we do it here in, in North America, you know, with well-funded national parks and a kind of fines and fences approach to um, enforcing conservation goals. And so the, the chronic poverty, poverty in Tajikistan means that wild sheep are, are going to be killed no matter what. It's just a question of who pulls the trigger. Is it going to be a wealthy foreigner who wants a, you know, ego-boosting trophy on their wall? Or is it going to be a local who's desperate for meat or the money that um, black market meat can, or meat can bring on the black market? And they have to kill a lot of, locals have to kill a lot of sheep because they don't actually get that much money from each sheep. And so we learned that of the, the estimated 25,000 Marco Polo sheep in Tajikistan, um, most of them live in the, the particular trophy hunting conservancy we visited. So in other words, it's, it's protecting nature in Tajikistan better than um, national parks in the country. And when Marco Polo sheep thrive, so do the snow leopards that eat them. And uh, this kind of makes foreign trophy hunters the unwitting heroes of wildlife conservation in the country. And uh, the conservancies also generate a bunch of well-paying jobs for locals, so they have incentive not to poach. They have better, better options. So to me, these experiences really hit home what I think is the true meaning and value of exploration. You know, it isn't about planting flags and leaving footprints. It isn't about how far you can go and how much you can suffer. It's really about how willing you are to let an experience rewrite your maps. And of course, maps will be rewritten whether we want it or not, which is the solace, but also the sadness of the Silk Road. You know, it's always in flux, as is the world generally. And the kingdoms and dynasties that Marco Polo traveled through um, are all dissolved now or, or different. And Alexander David Neal walked across a, a different world than the one that exists today. And so five years after our first trip, when we returned to finish the Silk Road, um, the Tibetan Plateau was, was hardly recognizable. So it was still illegal for foreigners to travel there without permits and guides, but this time the roads were paved and uh, lined with power lines like these, and a high-speed railway connected Beijing to Lhasa. There was cell service available all across the plateau. I don't even have cell service where I live in northern British Columbia. All across the Tibetan Plateau, you can, you can check your email. And as a result of increasingly violent actions by the Chinese government and the Tibetans who peacefully protested their, their presence. There were checkpoints now, not just on the fringes of the entire Tibetan Autonomous Region, but at the, the edge, the entry and exit of every single village. So we knew that in order to sneak across this way more regimented Tibet, that um, some extreme tactics were in order. Namely, disguising ourselves as androgynous Chinese cyclists. <laughs> so this sounds totally ludicrous, but it, it worked. Um, this was 2011. And uh, at the time, biking across the Tibetan Plateau to Lhasa was sort of a rite of passage for, for wealthy, young Chinese kids. Um, and so much so that every day we would see maybe half a dozen going the other way, like coming or going on this road to Lhasa. So whenever the checkpoint guards see a cyclist, they tend to just let them 
pass through because they assume they're Chinese. And so by, by dressing exactly like these Chinese cyclists, by flying Chinese flags on our bikes and wearing buffs as a kind of face mask, um, we figured the authorities wouldn't be able to tell us apart. Now, of course, if anyone spoke to us, it would be, we knew it would be game over. So we packed enough food to last a month on the road um, so we wouldn't have to stop in any towns to resupply. And we also hid our tent from the road each night. So for example, here's a lovely little campsite better known to locals as a garbage pit. <laughs> so rather amazingly, these stealth tactics work. You know, we biked past the Chinese police and they didn't even blink. It was astonishing. <laughs> but our, our disguise did have its drawbacks. Um, by looking like Chinese cyclists, we pretty much had free access to Tibet, which let us bear witness to things China didn't necessarily want us to see. But it also meant that Tibetans wanted nothing to do with us because we looked Chinese for all intents and purposes. So it was, it was very odd. You know, as I, as I biked along, I almost felt like I was back in a spacesuit in Utah, um, effectively behind plexiglass again. And, and it hit home that, you know, whatever you, whatever you see and experience in a place is always limited by your mode of, of exploration. And this really hit home when we caught up with a, a couple pilgrims. So we saw this Tibetan man and woman um, prostrating themselves along the road. Um, this is the highway to Lhasa. And they basically take a step and then slide their, their hands and knees and then torso to the ground and then touch their foreheads to the pavement and stand up, take a few more steps, and then repeat, repeat this action. And all while traffic is screeching by just a, a few feet away. So Mel and I, you know, we took great pride. We were traveling pretty light. Um, we carried just enough food and gear to see us across the plateau. But these two carried nothing but the clothing they wore. Um, they wore thick wool sleeves to protect their arms and leather aprons to protect their knees and, and torsos and wooden paddles on their hands. But their foreheads were bare. And in the middle of each of them was this coin-sized callus, a kind of third eye caused by the friction between pavement and skin. So you just have to imagine, you know, we're biking along, flying our Chinese flags. We, we rock up to these two looking very Chinese. And to our surprise, they didn't flinch. They, they didn't look away. They didn't seem to see us as Chinese people or strangers or threats. They really just seemed to see us as potentially good people. And in the heart of an incredibly repressive regime, it seemed like these two were living in a, a world without borders. And maybe the only place that that world can exist is, is in our minds. So eventually we parted ways and Mel and I pulled our, our face masks back on. We did pull them down and they were very surprised to see, you know, a, a blonde, two girls, one blonde, one redhead with freckles. Um, they cracked up. So we biked away and I watched them on the road behind me in my handlebar mirror. And every time a transport truck would pass close to them, I just kind of hold my breath, hoping I'd see them rise again once the dust settled. And I thought about how with, with every step they took, with every repetition of this, this prayer, um, the calluses on their brows would have grown thicker and denser, um, hardened to a dark and, and permanent shine. And I realized that sometimes scars are a kind of protection. Sometimes even wilderness needs a wall. And in a sense, I think we're all starved for whatever it was that pulled those pilgrims to their feet. You know, some kind of faith or hope or vision that gives compass and meaning to this, this brief stint we all enjoy under the stars. And many days, you know, it's, it's really easy to want to check out, to, to give up on this world of undeniably diminished possibilities. Um, escapism, whether it's into cynicism or despair or the idea of emigrating to another planet, in my case, is incredibly seductive. And so whenever I'm tempted by it, which is fairly often when I look at the news, uh, I think of those pilgrims making their way down an indifferent road in a country no longer theirs. And I think of them moving through the world as if their most immense responsibility to it is wonder. And I think to travel is to fall in love with the world and to be heartbroken by it and to love it despite its brokenness um, and to love it so much you eventually learn to call it home. You know, the poet T.S. Eliot famously said that the end of all our exploring is to drive back where we started and know the place for the first time. But I actually don't think he went far enough. I don't think the point of exploring is to just get to know this pale blue dot we live on, to make really accurate maps of it. The point is to come to care for it, to feel a sense of loyalty and belonging to it. 
Because for all its beauty and brokenness, its wildness and tameness and borders of all kinds, it's the only home we have in all the universe, the only place we can actually breathe. Um, we all share in its fragility and in its fate, and I, I think we shouldn't need any better reason to take care of it and uh, each other as well. So to finish off, that's really my great hope for what exploration in its modern incarnation, um, whether in the world, in maps, in, in words, can do. Namely, wake us up to wonder again, shake us from complacency, and make us fall so deeply in love with this planet that we're never again tempted, as I once was, to abandon it for Mars. <laughs> so thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for having me, Nasus.